Hello and welcome to Truth or Myth, a Star Trek web series that takes a look at the truth, or canon, to dispel any myths that have popped up over the years on any given topic. Today we're going to look at some of the behind the scenes information that has come to light about the great bird of the galaxy himself, Gene Roddenberry, in order to set the record straight about some of the myths surrounding the Star Trek giant. Gene Roddenberry was an amazing man, but he was only a man. Many Star Trek fans tend to view him as some sort of god, and why not? After all, he created Star Trek, a franchise that grew to have one of the largest pop culture fan bases in television history. But what most of us fans don't realize is that Roddenberry was somewhat of a storyteller, and as a result is single-handedly responsible for several large myths about Star Trek that have shown up over the years. This video isn't intended to diminish the man or his accomplishments. It's merely created to set the record straight and give credit where credit is due. So what are the sources for debunking these myths? Well first, there's Herb Solo, who was the Vice President of Desilu Studios, Vice President of Paramount Television, and the executive in charge of Star Trek itself. And then there's Robert Bob Justman, who was the associate, then later co-producer of Star Trek. Two very talented men that deserve almost as much of the credit for Star Trek's creations as Roddenberry himself. Justman would also go on to work with Gene on Star Trek The Next Generation's first season, remaining a close friend of Gene Roddenberry's up to the end of Roddenberry's life. But that wasn't enough for me, so I needed at least a third source for each debunking. And so every myth that is reported on here is backed up by at least one of the biographies from the TOS main cast actors, and usually more than one. Mainly though, William Shatner. As his Star Trek Memories biography, he went around and interviewed so many people involved in the show, and mostly corroborated everything the other two men have claimed. One of the biggest and first myths I remember was surrounding Star Trek's first pilot, The Cage. As the story goes, apparently, after screening the pilot, the network execs said it wasn't what they wanted, but then made the unprecedented move to commission a second pilot. But this pilot would have strings attached. One being that they didn't want a female first officer, that they felt it wasn't believable to have a woman in charge. This was a story that Roddenberry himself loved to tell, and it's a great story, but that's all it is, a story. You see, the truth is rather more complex. According to Herb Solo, Robert Justman, and William Shatner, Roddenberry loved women. So much so, in fact, that shortly before Star Trek began, he had a short affair with Nichelle Nichols, who played Ohura on Star Trek, but also began a long-term affair with Majel Barrett. According to Nichols, At the time, Roddenberry wanted to remain in an open relationship with both of us. But after I saw Majel's devotion to him, I ended the affair. I did not want to be the other woman to the other woman. So what does that have to do with the female first officer position? Roddenberry was married at the time, and having Majel on set meant they could spend a lot more time together and keep the affair relatively secret. Well, the network execs knew all about the affair. First off, they didn't care much for Majel as an actor, and felt she couldn't carry the series as a lead. Second, they didn't much like the idea of being used by Roddenberry so he could have an affair. And third, if the good, upstanding people of 1960s America got wind of what was actually going on, the scandal could seriously harm the network. And so, the network told him Majel had to go. So what did Roddenberry do? He did what he did best. He came up with a story to tell Majel, and eventually the world, that would put him and her in a good light, while at the same time not hurting her feelings. And later, it would paint the network in a bad light to Trekkers and Trekkies, since he had a falling out with the network at the end of season two, and it seemed like a great opportunity to smear them. So no. The network never had a problem with a female first officer, but simply had a problem with Majel herself, and of course, Jean's affair with her. 
One other thing of note in regards to Majel is that Jean loved to tell the story about how he got her back on the series as Nurse Chapel, that he had her dye her hair and use her maiden name, and the network never realized. This was also a tall tale, as the network knew exactly who she was. But since it was a minor character and would not be seen very much, they simply agreed to let him have that one. And so, Nurse Chapel was born. Another famous myth is that Gene, in order to sell his Star Trek idea, dressed up in his L.A. PD outfit and demanded to see the execs at Desilu. Then, after finally being allowed in, he pulled out what would become known as the Star Trek Bible, slammed it on Solo's desk, and said read it, and then walked out into the mist. Solo, being so enthralled by this, immediately read the Bible several times and so impressed by it, called Roddenberry up the next day, and a deal was struck. The truth is rather more underwhelming. Desilu, which was owned by Lucille Ball at the time, you know, everyone's favorite comedy redhead, had made some horrible decisions and as such was desperate for an idea to make a series that would keep them afloat. In April of 1964, Roddenberry showed up for his scheduled appointment with Solo. And no, he wasn't dressed as a police officer. As Solo recalls, my first impression of Gene was a tall, unkept man who hadn't quite learned how to dress himself yet. He was shy and mumbled often. That's a far stone's throw from the myth though, isn't it? Roddenberry also loved to take credit for things, whether they were his creation or not. Take, for example, the main theme of Star Trek The Original Series. If you look closely, you'll notice that there is a co-writing credit for Roddenberry. Why? Well, back then, royalties was a big supplement to a person like Gene's income. And so, after the theme had been recorded, Gene took that sheet music, wrote lyrics to the theme, and therefore included him in the royalty pool. That's right, every time that music was heard, Gene Roddenberry got a piece of the action. Even though he never really had anything to do with the music, and his lyrics to the theme were never used and only known by the most hardcore fans. The true hero of the main theme was Alexander Sandy Courage. No one else, really. So instead of receiving 100% of the royalties for his creation, now, that 100% would be split into 50% for Courage and 50% for Roddenberry. He was truly an amazing and talented musician. And it's no wonder that Courage would become disillusioned with Star Trek and his friendship with Roddenberry. He would end up scoring only two of the first episodes and then leave Star Trek never to look back. Another example of this occurs for the episode Mud's Women. Steve Kandel and Roddenberry pitched story ideas back and forth before settling on the one that Kandel would write. A few weeks later, Kandel gave his script to Gene, and Kandel said he would polish or rewrite anything as need be. Gene responded that he only wanted to change a few minor things about the script, so there would be no need. However, once the script was finalized with those very minor changes, Gene submitted his name as the story creator, something which wasn't really true at all. In fact, the iconic line, Where No Man Has Gone Before, which Roddenberry has often taken credit for, was created by Sam Peoples, and not Roddenberry. Sam Peoples wrote the second pilot by the same name. Now, it should be noted that Roddenberry, in fact, did write a numerous amount of what was known as springboard papers, these were a paragraph or two about what a story should be about, and then these would be handed to the writer who would take that idea and run with it. But many an arbitration would result as Gene Roddenberry would oftentimes demand the story created by credit for the springboards. This would oftentimes really tick off the writers of Star Trek, and as such, the pool of writers would grow even smaller filling back up with inexperienced writers who really just wanted the paycheck. In fact, 
John D.F. Black was so angered by Roddenberry that when his writer's contract expired, he cracked open a bottle of champagne and toasted the fact that he no longer worked for Gene Roddenberry. Roddenberry would also take credit for many other concepts and creations for the show. For example, the Klingons and their culture were actually created by Gene Kuhn, not Roddenberry. And the Captain's Log was a concept created by Herb Solo himself, to speed up exposition needed to inform the audience what the Enterprise was up to that week. Interestingly enough, one story Roddenberry never embellished was that of the network's renewal of Star Trek's third season, and what happened to cause him to pull back almost completely from it. With the third season renewal, Roddenberry seemed renewed and invigorated, promising an increased involvement in the series. However, this would not come to be. Why? Well, when the network attempted to juggle all its series into an effective schedule, they moved Star Trek to Friday night at 10 p.m., what was known as the Graveyard Slot, so named because any series that ended up there would tend to die a slow and painful death. This was especially poignant for Star Trek. Its audience, mainly teens and those in their early 20s, tended to not be home Friday nights to watch anything. And so, in a desperate gambit to keep Star Trek alive, Gene issued an ultimatum to the network. Either restore Star Trek to its original time slot, or he would cut his creative involvement with Star Trek to a bare minimum, ensuring its death. The network, however, would not relent, and Gene was left with no choice but to pull back. As he tells it, I was caught between a rock and a hard place. If I didn't pull back, like I had threatened, the network execs would never again take me or my threat seriously. I'd be a joke to them. And if I did pull back, Star Trek would surely die after the third season. So with a fourth season of Star Trek not guaranteed, but future jobs for the network more than likely, Gene upheld his threat and the third season would become the last of Star Trek the original series. These are only a few of the bigger myths surrounding the man, and you may be asking, why did I make this video? Well, for one, a lot of people have been requesting behind-the-scenes Star Trek information, and Roddenberry seemed a great place to start. There can be no denying what he created, and that of course is Star Trek. But we oftentimes forget all the people who were right there along for the ride, creating just as much of Star Trek as Gene was responsible for. The truth deserves to be known, and credit given where credit is due, and I have no qualms about exposing those myths. I'm also sure some people will be upset that I had the nerve to make this video about a man who they view as a god of the franchises. And to those people, all I can say is, I understand how you feel. It never feels good to have an idol of yours brought back down to reality. But truth is truth. And what is the first duty of every Starfleet officer? The first duty of every Starfleet officer is to the truth, whether it's scientific truth or historical truth or personal truth. In the end, Roddenberry was a great man. There's no denying that. He gave us Star Trek, and that can never be forgotten. But remember this, he was only a man. Thank you for watching today's episode of Truth or Myth. What do you think about Gene Roddenberry and the almost godlike myths that have surrounded him? Well, leave a comment in the section below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help the channel out to expose all the myths out there? Then become a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching. Live long and prosper.